Okay, we're gonna move on to Gert Collenbergs. Gert is Professor of Bioengineering and co-director of the Institute for Neural Computation. He's gonna speak on reverse engineering. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat freaked out by this title, I'll, I'll have to say. Reverse engineering the cognitive brain. Uh, having dealt with a society that has done a lot of reverse engineering and obviously in a very different way. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So, yes, I guess I'm the oddball here as an engineer, but uh, so we'll, in fact, we'll connect uh, with many disciplines here. That's the, key, the whole key here of, of our um, workshop. So, it's a very exciting time for neuroscience, in fact, not just for neuroscientists, but for all of us. Scientists, engineers, um, artists, because humanities, um, and really, because it it's all coming together, um, it's quite amazing if you think of it that, that even Washington is, is fully aware that the brain is important, that, that we have to really study it and understand it, and that uh, President Obama is, is completely behind it. This is in the forefront of the agenda. In fact, we owe it to some local champions here, so Nick and, and uh, Ralph will really be championing this in, in, in Washington. And also Tarasinovsky, whom many of you may recognize here at the right hand of uh, President Obama. Right, so. Um, so, and what is this about? So why, why does it take all of us three to engage in this, this uh, activity, right? So why can't a single discipline do it? Well, it's just so complex, the brain is so complex, involves so many levels of, of um, scale, uh, down to molecules, I guess single elements, atoms even if you want, or ions moving in, 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 in a solution. Uh, all the way up to the brain as a whole, and the brain as a whole, of course, interacts with the environment, right? Interacts, because in, in, in terms of uh, in movement, it, it, it does things, but also it interacts socially, and that's also what we're here uh, uh, talking about today. So those different levels of, of, of representation require a vast set of tools and, and, and um, approaches, and um, uh, neuroscientists typically have delved into the details of ion channels, I guess uh, synapses, neurons, uh, all the molecular scale of, of things. And now the Brain Initiative is really pushing this up and, 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 and extending the scale to, the, right, to that of, of eventually the whole brain, millions of neurons, et cetera. Right? So that's all very exciting. But from an engineering perspective, it's also quite exciting to go the other direction. So scientists typically analyze whereas engineers synthesize, right? So go the other direction and build brains up from the bottom up, right? So that's say, uh, in, in the words of Rich, Richard Feynman, if you can't build something, you haven't tr uh, fully understood it. So, uh, and that, that's a major than, than the, um, um, because a, um, an endeavor of neuromorphic systems engineering. Um, and once we're at the level, once we're able to build those, those brains or, or something that looks like a brain, then it becomes also exciting from a perspective of computational neuroscience. We can emulate very large models, and we can also study brains and behavior on a very large scale. So it then becomes interesting for, for all of us, uh, including uh, humanities and, and, and arts. Right? So that's it can uh, get quite exciting. But what it started here is this this concept of neuromorphic engineering in, in a way that shows that we have this extension, physical extension of some of the, the foundations of, of the physical origins of, of, of computation in the nervous system, uh, then all the way to uh, similar I guess, mechanisms, isomorphisms, into then uh, circuits and, and silicon. So Carver Mead uh, showed that um, uh, the same mechanisms of transport, ion transport, that you have in, in ion, I guess, ion, through ion channels, through membranes, also apply to transport of electrons or holes in silicon, and so immediately the, um, uh, the idea that started here is, well, can we now build in silicon uh, uh, physical elements of, of this neural computation down uh, from the uh, starting uh, ion channels and up to circuits and then eventually to the, the whole brains. And it has been very exciting, a very exciting journey over the last 30 years. So here's an example of some early work uh, where, where you actually take physically where we physically morph than what we know in neuroscience in, in terms of the circuits, the underlying circuits, and then some of the elements, photoreceptors, synapses, et cetera, neurons, and then build circuits that really um, implement those at the physical level. And, and here's an example of, of a circuit that had, say, a few hundred pixels. Of course, today, several years later, we can do now millions of pixels because uh, uh, modeling larger systems uh, for, for um, uh, cortical uh, computation. And here's some other examples and of systems that, that would show 
Um, you can even go down to the spiking level and understand, say, in this case, what the optic nerve is doing. You can observe some of the um, activity. It looks a bit grainy here, but I can actually quite... Um, it's amazing what we can see through our eyes, uh, f uh, f through this very noise representation that goes through the optic nerve, just spikes. Um, and th the fact is, we can have this amazing uh, capability of, of, of seeing uh, through this, this, this very noisy representation. So there is definitely something to it that, that um, it will be important for us to explore from a computational point of view. Right? So how does it all relate to cognition? Right? Where does cognition in this, let's say, studying the visual system? Right? So what is, what is so important in cognition? So uh, you, in cognition, you're dealing with a task, something you have to solve. A problem can either be defined explicitly as, as an, in a search case here, if you're doing search in, uh, for a given task, of course, cognition is more than that. There's also intent, and, and um, there is also um, reward, and, and all that can modulate intent and, and free will and that. But so in a particular task, a search task, there's a problem of complexity in that the, 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 task, uh, the, the task complexity induces large ma uh, machine complexity. If you want to search for something in the scene, and you want to uh, give a perfect answer, you just have to go through all the possible cases, you have to, uh, you have to explore the entire st state space, and digital computers really uh, are, um, have a hard time at this, at this in, in that the complexity scales quite dramatically with the, the complexity of the task. Uh, neuromorphic engineering then aims at an alternative means for solving these hard tasks by abstracting uh, complexity into simple representations that make use of this collective analog uh, imprecise, but this collective computation that allows them to uh, outperform them those techniques. Because um, simply is impossible uh, uh, to, to solve hard tasks with, with these digital techniques, but then this analog graded uh, techniques that are more aligned with, with the brain and allow us to then, uh, make progress here and build something closer to what, what the brain is doing. So that's the premise. Uh, but the key here for making this happen, where the complexity then becomes more constant, in, uh, where the machine complexity becomes more constant in function of task complexity, is the advantages here only occur or, or will, will, um, will be uh, prominent for problems with high uh, task complexity, which also infer this, this uh, quite relatively high uh, uh, machine complexity. You won't be able to solve a hard task that humans can solve unless you have the complexity of at least what the human brain has, has in, in, in store. So there are two aspects of this that are important. One is we have to, in order for, for normal engineering to, to get at a cognitive level and actually do something real, we need to, um, first of all, build systems that have a level of complexity in terms of power, in terms of uh, synaptic connections per second of the human brain. And also we need to then be able to abstract from the environment enough uh, knowledge uh, through learning that can abstract the representation of the world into this reduced representation, which actually is still very complex, 10 out of 15 synapses. Right? So there's a problem here of deep learning. And, and the great thing here is that, this, that, that such endeavor encompasses all the, all the different disciplines that you have here, because in, in, in the room, and there's definitely engineering involved here, nanoscience, uh, also cognitive science, I guess, the, uh, um, I guess how you, you train those systems, but also humanities and arts, and, right? So there are issues that, that I won't go into, I guess, um, um, but, but they're definitely very important aspects that, that also can be addressed here at, at all the different um, 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 scales, right? And so we have now systems with millions of neurons, billions of synapses, right? So I won't go into too many details here, but um, so it gets very exciting in that we can start building the systems up uh, with resources we have here, the supercomputer center, et cetera, to, to make this really a, a, um, a community-driven uh, uh, effort for, for, um, and resource for simulating very large-scale networks. Um, and using some of the advanced nanotechnology out there, including phase change memory, what will be going in, in the next generation of, of memory uh, that you have uh, in your cell phones, uh, we can build these very large arrays of synapses, emulating them as these very large networks uh, that are important. And we can integrate all this with CMOS, uh, standard uh, CMOS circuits, standard uh, uh, sil silicon circuits, to uh, then uh, build these very large uh, scale networks. Not quite 10 to the 15 synapses and 10 to 12 neurons, but we can get close to that, I guess, uh, sooner or later. And power is also extremely important here. So power can be then, uh, right, so now we have systems that, that operate at femtojoules per CMT operation, which is actually at one part of the human brain, of course, uh, with all due respect that the brain is doing much more than just um, accumulating uh, information because uh, with synaptic connectivity, you can also train the systems, right? So we're putting things together, so at the level of, of um, behavior, so where we couple those neural systems 
um, and, and, uh, and studying then the brain, um, uh, interacting with the environment, right? So then um, we, we can start asking questions that, that, that um, really touch upon our lives and, and, and social interactions. Uh, using different modalities of, 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 of what's involved here, but so the key here is that, um, and that um, so so we have this this community here, uh, and INC Institute of Neurocomputation is one of the organized research units, right? That is active at connecting across different disciplines. In this case, for neurocomputation, uh, connect, making bridges on campus, right? To really pull together then the different disciplines involved here on campus, um, but then also because in the larger community, right? So getting making connections then. Uh, with local companies and and, uh, I guess, uh, and and globally for really advancing then this this um, arts and, and science of of, of neurocomputation into uh, into the uh, the real world. So, thank you.